So this weekend, I wanna talk to you about Jesus' death on your behalf. And I wanna talk to you about saving grace. So when you think about grace, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says that it's the multi-faceted, multi-many-fold uh, grace of God, multi-sided grace of God. So grace is not just one thing. Grace is many things. And one of the things grace is, when we talk about Jesus' death on your behalf, we're talking about saving grace. That's one thing that God's grace is. It's saving grace. And I love this old quote. It goes like this. We owed a debt. All of us owed a debt that we could not pay. And Jesus paid a debt that he did not owe. Come on. He paid a debt he didn't know. He didn't know the debt for us. He did it for us. It's part of God's grace. So when you think about grace, I want you to think about this just for a moment. Have any of you ever paid off a debt? And when you paid the debt off, you just felt that weight lift because, man, you paid off that debt. It was just like, oh, man, paid off that debt, and it just feels so good. My wife and I, we were talking about this uh, this past weekend as we got into uh, doing this Easter weekend, and we were talking about this how back years ago when we were a young couple, we were buying a house and we didn't have enough money for the down payment. Anyone ever buy a house and it's like, I wanna buy a house. I think I can afford the payments, but man, that down payment is the thing I don't have. Well, we didn't have that. We were a young couple and someone loaned us the money for the down payment. And after we got everything approved, we got the loan. And so we were paying the loan off for the house each month and we were having to make a payment to the people that gave us the money. And man, we were praying and we were like, God, this is, this is really hard. We got this debt that we owe. And then one day, someone knocked at our door and said, we feel like God told us to give you this money. And it was the amount of money we owed on the debt. Now, this is back when we were just young uh, couple. And we could remember how much it felt like something was just lifted. But you know what else we felt like? This is too good to be true. This is hard to believe that someone is actually doing this wasn't the same person that gave us the money. It was someone else that just said, we want to give you this money. Little did they know we had this debt and it paid it off completely. Not our loan on the house, but it paid off that loan we owned the people that we owed them. And we felt like such freedom. Now listen closely. This is the part I want you to hear. That is how grace works. God paid a debt for you through Jesus Christ that was ridiculously a big debt. You could have never paid it. He paid it off. And when we receive Christ, that debt is lifted from us. Everyone in this room probably has experienced that or will experience that today. And everyone joining us, if Fairlawn are joining us online. But I want to talk to you about what is saving grace. So saving grace is real simple. If you've been with us for a while in our church, you probably already know this. Don't wanna bore you. But I want you to know that there's not a better weekend to hear about saving grace. The weekend that Jesus Christ came, died, resurrected for you and I. What a great weekend to hear about saving grace. So if you're taking notes, jotting notes down, you can jot this down. And again, we say it every weekend, our notes are on the Bible app. If you go to Faith Family on there, you can find our notes and follow right along and have them all there already written out for you. So the first thing I wanna talk to you about, Jesus saved us by grace. We know that, right? Jesus saved us by grace. Here's what I know. Most of you don't know me. My wife was in our, in our first worship experience here and she, we went, went in the back and she said, it just would be amazing if the people in our church knew where you came from. Most of you don't know. You don't know how good and how well of a sinner I was. I was one of the best. And Paul, the apostle, writes about that, and he talks about how I was. I was one of those guys. I was one of the best. I sinned with the best of them. But then Jesus came. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. No one does. But Jesus comes and lifts a burden off of us, and he gets us back with God so that we will have a right relationship with God. And in 2 Timothy, Paul's writing in chapter 1 and verse 8 and 9, and in 2 Timothy, he says, God, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works. We're going to talk about that more in a moment, but according to his own purpose and grace. And I love this part, which was given to us in Christ Jesus before time began. Let me just say this to you. It's mind-boggling when you think about it. Before time began, God had a plan. 
before time began, God knew I will, I will create man in the garden, Adam and Eve. They will sin, but I have a plan. I will send a savior to the earth that will save all of earth if they want it. So you know that person you know right now that is far from God? You know that person right now that you think, you know, they, they, they've never come to Christ, they've never come to God? That person right now, Jesus already paid a price for them. 2,000 plus years ago, Jesus died on a cross and he did it for you and I, but not just you and I. He did it for future people. He did it for people back years ago. Jesus did this so that all of the earth could hear about him and come to him. That's why there's so many religions taking people in the wrong way and so many false cults and all those kind of things. What we really need today on this planet is we need a revival of Jesus to show people that he is the only way and there is no other way but through and by him. So we know this, that as Christ followers, Jesus came and he brought grace to us and that is how salvation comes. But the second thing is real simple, salvation cannot be earned. I want you to think about that. Salvation cannot be earned. So here's the problem. If you came out of religion like I did, many of you know the religion I came out of. Many of you came out of the same type of religious background. I, I grew up in a religion that everything had to be earned. And because I came out of a religion where everything had to be earned, and it was where it was my years of being young and growing up, I still have today remind myself I don't owe anything to God and don't have to earn anything from God. Jesus did everything freely. Even if I make a mistake, I don't have to earn my place back with God. You and I do not have to earn our salvation. It is a free gift. And once you accept Christ, you don't have to try to keep on doing good things to earn something from God. Can you say amen? Now in Ephesians, Paul's writing in chapter two. Many of us know this verse if we were raised in church. In Ephesians 2, 8, it says, for by grace, you are saved. You and I were saved by the grace of God. Nothing you did could ever earn this salvation. You can't earn it. It was a love gift. I love this part. It's a love gift from God. Jesus is a love gift from God. Grace is a love gift from God. I love that that brought us to Christ. So no one will ever be able to say, none of you will be able to say this, I can't say it, that we can boast about salvation like we earned it on ourselves. Salvation is never a reward for good works or human striving. So you think you earned it, you didn't earn it. You think you can do something for it, you can't. In fact, the Bible literally says this. If you try to earn your salvation, the Bible calls it dead works. Once you're a Christ follower, if you think I'm gonna earn my way back with God, the Bible calls it dead works. Jesus did everything as a free gift. In fact, sometimes it feels like this is too good to be true. But I wanna ask you this question. Maybe some of you feel like you're just tired you're just burnt out. You know, in talking to people over this last year, the thing I heard, one of the things I heard the most was, I'm just tired. I'm just wore out. And it wasn't just tired and wore out from what was going on. Some of them even got tired and wore out on the religion they were affiliated with. They were just like, I'm tired of religion. Anyone here ever get tired of religion? Can I just tell you this? This is not religion today. And Jesus is not religion. He is freedom. And one day Jesus was talking, and I love what Jesus said. He was talking about religion when he said this, but even if you're tired no matter what today, this is great for you to hear. It says this in Matthew chapter 11, and if you wanna just listen to this, Matthew 11, 28, verse uh, 28 through 30, in the message translation, it says this, are you tired? I love that. Are you tired? Jesus is asking, are you worn out? Are you burnt out on religion? Watch what Jesus says. Come to me. There is no better place to go than to come to Jesus when you are tired, burnt out, fed up, don't wanna hear anymore, can't stand religion, don't want anything to do with religion. Just come to Jesus. Come on. Not to a church, not to a person, not to a pastor. Come to Jesus. All we are here to do is to point people to Jesus Christ. 
He says, come to me. Get away with me, and I love this part. You'll recover your life. I'll show you how you can take a rest, and I, I get a real rest, and I like that. Walk with me, and I'll work with you. I love that. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. That is so amazing. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you is what Jesus says. He says, keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Can I say this to you? If something's heavy on you right now, it's not from God. If something is a burden in your life right now, it's not from God. Because Jesus came so that it wouldn't be a heavy burden on us. So Jesus gave us salvation through grace. I love this, that we can't earn it because Jesus earned it for us. But lastly, if you're taking notes, we accept this free gift by believing. So let me go back to that story about my wife and I and that money that someone gave us. It was such a, a burden lifting thing at the time. But can I tell you this? Since then, my wife and I had the privilege and the honor by paying off someone else's debt and helping someone else. Now listen, I don't want you to clap for me. I want you to hear this. The joy that it gave us is greater joy than when the people gave us the money. In fact, I want you to know this. There is much greater joy in releasing someone from a debt and helping them than there is you getting it yourself. Even though you think it'd be great if someone gave it to you, there's something about you being the one being able to help someone else. So check this out. The moment that God sees a person come to him and receive his grace... I had such joy when I gave this to someone else, when Pastor Barb and I gave it to someone else, such joy. Can I tell you there's joy in heaven? The moment that someone comes and says, I wanna receive the free gift of salvation. The moment you do that, the Bible says there's joy in heaven. Great joy in heaven. So can I encourage you? The Bible literally tells us the way that we receive this free gift is by believing. You don't receive the free gift in some weird kind of way. You don't receive the free gift because you joined a church. You don't receive the free gift because you gave some money and you think I get the gift now of salvation. You receive the free gift by believing. In fact, here's what scripture says. In John's gospel, many of you know it. Uh, if you've been at a football game, basketball game where someone's holding up the sign, John 3, 16. John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son, Jesus. That's who he gave, right? What did he do that for? So that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. It's so simple, but I love this part. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. And I think we have a lot of condemning going on in the planet we live in right now. But Jesus came to save the world through him. God gave Jesus so that he could save the world through him. Paul came along, and Paul's writing in Romans chapter 10, 9 and 10, very familiar scripture if you've been part of our church. But in verse 9, he says, if you openly declare, or, and if you openly say something with your mouth, you openly confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe, that's how you receive, in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's how salvation comes. For it is with by believing with your heart or in your heart that you will be made right with God and is open declaring your faith that you are saved. Salvation can come no other way. So I wanna ask you this question. Maybe you are here today joining us online at Fairlawn or in this building, and maybe you feel like, I wanna believe. I, I, I wanna believe what you're saying is true. I wanna believe that Jesus is really like this pastor. You know, the way that you can tell if the message of Jesus Christ really is true is by lives that are changed by it. And I want you to just check out this story. Stick with us. I'll be back up just to talk for a couple more minutes. I want you to check out a story of a person's life who was changed by Jesus Christ. Check this out. I went out with like very grand aspirations for what I was gonna do with my time on that trail. And I ended up just like thinking about the next step a lot. All right, take one more, take one more, take one more. Like I think back to like my walk, like with God. And I realized, you know, that's kind of what my life was. 
Let me give you a, a snapshot of who I was back then. Played poker and, and drank and um, drank a lot. I was just lighting one cigarette off the other, so smoke one. When you get to the end and light it, it's all day. I didn't trust people. Um, I, uh, I, didn't, I didn't like people. The smoking, the drinking, uh, the drugs, like all of it, the whole, the whole purpose of it was to shorten my life. My goal is no expression on my face, no, like, you're not gonna know what I'm thinking, what I'm doing, what I like, what I don't like, because then there's no chance for you to ever hurt me. In 06, I got to spend time with Dad. Um, we used to golf, like, way back when, but I hadn't golfed with him for a while because he was hurt. Um, but, uh, yeah, we just... We'd eat breakfast together, you know, smoke cigarettes. <laughs> it was kind of it. Yeah, he died, and then I didn't know what to do. I mean, I knew what to do, but I didn't have a reason to do it. All the things that I felt before, as far as like loneliness and just isolation and nobody understanding me, this got worse. Still smoking. I mean, that was kind of like my piece of dad that was left, like was a cigarette, so. I didn't really have anybody to, like, achieve anything for. Like, there was no reason. But with Dad, there was. And with Gramp, there was. So I definitely, like, took a good four or five months there and really went off the rails. Usually early part of the afternoon, and um, I drink a bottle of scotch. Like, that was kind of my thing. Just the house. Just have a bottle of scotch. And then I go to the bar. And then I close the bar down on Saturday night. And then I go to a poker game where there was a fridge full of beer that was just for me. So that was kind of like every weekend. And then I go back, I work, you know, 14, 16 hour days. I knew why I needed to go to church. Um, I listened to this guy named Zig Ziglar and Zig Ziglar said, regardless of whether you're a Christian or not, you should be going to church. And then on top of that, I got the like added benefit of, I get to take Grandma to church, which Grandpa would have liked. And then I'm like getting intrigued and pulling my Bible out. Um, at different times for different reasons. There's a point where I just, I knew I need to like make a decision. But for me, it was a logic question. It was like a logic puzzle, which was um, either he's a complete fraud, either Jesus is a complete fraud, or uh, he is exactly who he says he is. That was like kind of my line in the sand and, and I walked over it. When I made that step, like, that's when, like, that grace just, like, kind of flooded in. I was a Christian for a little while before I found a church. And eventually, I, I get invited to Faith Family. Uh, and I was here on, a, like, a very specific Wednesday night. I, like, remember the speaker. I remember the message. Like, I remember everything about that night. And I remember just not wanting to leave. I decided I was going to get involved because I'm here now. And I had the first flash, like, that I had where I experienced like purpose. I started to appreciate all these people that I was around. I just started to appreciate them for, for them. By God's grace, you know, this year in April, I'll be nine years sober. Once I became a Christian, I knew that there was gonna be growth. And like, I knew that one way that I could chase growth was having these big, like audacious goals when I met those challenges, I wouldn't be able to get through them myself. Like God would have to show up. I decided at that point, I'm gonna run 100 miles in 24 hours. I signed up for this 24 hour race up in Kirtland that was taking place, I think five months after I decided I was gonna do it. My legs were dead after 50 miles. I mean, 50 miles in, I ran the first 50 miles in like around 10 hours. Um, and so I'm like way ahead of the game, 
you know? But I got another 50 miles to go to hit my goal. And my legs were done. I ended up uh, going and doing 101 miles. Like on a one mile trail. Ran it 101 times. I had started dating Emily just a little bit, maybe a year before I started really getting into the running. When I decided to do this race, Emily crewed me on the race. Basically what that means on a 24 hour race with a one mile loop is Emily doesn't get to sleep. She'd fill my waters, make sure I had plenty of electrolytes in there, all that kind of stuff, but she wouldn't break. When I finished that race, I knew God's grace has changed me from someone who uh, hated people to someone who develops people and leads people. From someone who smoked four packs a day to running ultra marathons, from being alone to having a beautiful family. I could never earn this or deserve this. That's the grace of God. What a great story. For all of you that don't know who Ned is, Ned now is on our staff here at the church because God changed his life so much. And if you've ever gone through Starting Point, you know who Ned is. And I love the story about he hated people, he couldn't, you know, he didn't trust people, didn't wanna be around people, all of those things that he said. And now God has changed his life completely. And if Ned's life can be changed, your, your life could be changed the same way. I know my life, the story is very similar to Ned's, and I know my life was changed by Jesus. So I wanna just take a moment as we close up today. Before we have you dismissed, before you leave this place, I think Resurrection Weekend, Easter Weekend, is one of the most important weekends to say yes to one simple thing. I need Jesus. And no matter who you are, no matter how bad your life has been, we all need Jesus in our life. All of us who received him, we're like, man, I need more. Like, it's not just like you wanna stop because you received him into your life. But if you're here, no matter how bad you've been, no matter how many bad things you've done in life, no matter what you've done in life, the Apostle Paul wrote something in Romans, and I think it explains it better than anything. In Romans chapter three, Paul says this in verse 20. He says, now do you see it? He's asking a question. No one can be ever made right with God or right in God's sight by doing what is under the law. They kept on going back under the law. And you know, the Bible says when you try to go back under the law, you'll just start doing wrong. In fact, it says, for the more we know of God's laws, we know this, the clearer it becomes. When we know God's law, the clearer it becomes that we aren't obeying them and these laws serve only to make us see that we are sinners. So when you try to go back under laws, it just lets you know, hey, it makes you look like, man, I, I can't ever do this. I'm a sinner, I need a savior. But I like this, it goes on, it says, but now God has shown us a different way to heaven. I like that, he's shown us a different way to heaven. Not by being good enough, that's what we talked about today not trying to keep his laws, but by a new way. And this new way that you and I now have, though it's really not new, the scripture says, because it's been in scriptures times told in the past, right? It talks about how long ago it was talked about. Now God says he will accept and acquit us. He declares us not guilty. Some of you walked into church this weekend, whether you came in the building, whether you came in Fairlawn's building, or whether you came online, and you feel like, I am guilty. But scripture says, he has declared you not guilty. Man, if I could tell you the life I was living, I don't have time, before I received Jesus. And when I found out he declared me not guilty, it felt like a million pounds was lifted off of my life because all of a sudden I found out there's a savior who loved me, who cared for me, and who said, you know what? I'm acquitting you and you are not guilty any longer. You are free. And I love this in Romans, he says this. 
if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. Trusting simply means putting faith in him, simply believing. If I trust in Jesus, if you trust in Jesus, we now, the scripture goes on and says, and we can all now say that we can be saved in this same way. All of us can do that by coming to Christ. No matter who you are, or no matter what you've been like. Man, I was like really bad. Some of you might be here and say, man, I'm like pretty good. But regardless, we all need a savior because of this. All have sinned. I love this part. It says, yes, all have sinned and all have come uh, short of God's glorious ideal. All of us have sinned. Everyone in this place, everyone, wherever you're joining us from, we've all sinned. But it goes on and says this, and yet now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ. So I wanna take a moment. Maybe you're here. Maybe you've never trusted in Jesus. Maybe you had a really bad year. You know, I was talking in our, our other worship experiences and I know just looking out at some of the people, I knew there were people in our worship experience. They lost loved ones this year. I know who they are, I know who they lost. And so maybe you're hurting. Maybe you feel like, you know what? Ah, I lost a loved one. And I'm so mad, I'm so hurting. We totally understand. We understand that what you need right now is you need someone to come alongside you and help you. So if you've lost a loved one, you lost a job, things just went really bad this last year, can I tell you there's a God that loves you? Can I tell you that there's hope when it looks like there is no hope? And Jesus is the one that brings that hope. So I wanna do something that's real simple. I wanna pray a prayer. And if you need Jesus in your life, I'm gonna ask everyone to pray the prayer together. So we're gonna all do this together in a moment. Or if you'd say, Pastor, you know what? Somehow, some way, I got away from God and I'd like to just make a fresh commitment on Resurrection Sunday. I wanna make a fresh commitment to Jesus. Would, would you all join with me? Would you close your eyes just for a moment and bow your heads? Let's pray this prayer together. And if you need Jesus in your life or you wanna recommit your life, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Say it out loud. Everybody in the place, everyone joining us, wherever you're joining us from, say this out loud. Oh God, I repent of my sins. I ask Jesus Christ to come into my life. Forgive me. And I thank you now that the blood of Jesus Christ washes me clean. And I am now a new person in Christ. 